Hi, welcome back. This is Joshua's Diary, part four. I'm showing you a picture of what circle the wagons means. This is what they did every night on the wagon trail. Uh, they made a big circle of the wagons. The front would lock onto the back of the one in front of them. And the inside was a protected area where they could play and sit and chat. They built their fire and they cooked. So it was a, just a way to group together to protect each other. So when we last left, they were on their way to Fort Kearney. And I'm imagining that they're going to meet some new people, which means we have new characters that we can see what kind of traits and what type of people that they are. So for Fort Kearney, Mrs. Hull's baby was born this morning. He's been named for Kearney for the fort. He's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. He hasn't stopped wailing since he got born. Maybe he saw himself in our mirror. He's baby number 15 for them. Imagine. Fort Kearney, nighttime. I have to tell about the fort. There are lots of soldiers. There's a smithy. He's the one that does the horses, horseshoes. And a store and supplies. The walls and houses are made of sod. It doesn't look like much of a fort to me, but when we camped, I saw my first Indian. Actually, I saw many, many Indians. They're everywhere. They're not wild. Our men often smoke pipes with them. Our women make them tea. But Cousin Daniel doesn't trust them. He says, don't turn your back or they'll put an arrow in it. Sometimes I think I hate Cousin Daniel. Next morning, we left the fort early. Across the river, we saw a Mormon wagon. Some of the Mormon men waved to us. Children waved back. The Mormons had had bad things happen to them. Their leader, Joseph Smith, was killed, and Grandpa said it was only because people didn't like his beliefs. They're going to find a new home in Utah. Pa told me that Mormon men can have lots of wives. He then added, Heaven forbid, one is enough. That's because Ma is cross with everything now. There were so many mosquitoes and tadpoles in her cup of water yesterday that she tossed it out. It's alive, she said, to think one would drink a cup full of bugs. May 23rd. Bobby walks with Charlie and Adam and me too and me. Her mama doesn't mind her walking with the boys, but some of the mamas won't let their girls do that. Mrs. Meany is always making sharp comments about Bobby. Bobby says Mrs. Meany reminds her of the mosquitoes. They bite and nip at you and you always want to slap them. I think I'll like Bobby just fine. May 26th. We were setting up camp tonight. Suddenly the sky turned black. The wind whipped sand around us and the oxen lowered their head. We tried to turn our backs but sand was everywhere. Even my mouth got full of it. And then the rain just poured down. I saw Adam run to his pa and his pa pushed him away. Charlie and I huddled under the wagon but we were still soaked through. Ma says not to worry, the weather will dry out soon. It can't be soon enough for me. May 27th, I'm still wet and shivering and it's still raining. My book is soaked through. I don't dare turn a page for fear I will tear, it will tear. I'll write some more when the sun comes out. May 29th, the sun will never come out. Three days and it's still raining. Water runs down my neck. My plate fills with water when we eat. My shoes squish water. I sleep in mud. Today I saw a snake swimming alongside me. My yell to watch out. Even Pa seems fed up tonight. He snapped at Becky when she soiled herself. He told Ma that Becky was too big to do that. And Becky cried. When I went to comfort her, Pa and Ma both glared at me. I took Becky outside. We played in the mud under the wagon. Why not? We were soaked through anyway. Morning, May 30th. The sun came up so bright this morning, I could yell for happiness. Everyone stood around soaking it up. Ma, <clears throat> Ma and Aunt Lizzie laid out beds to dry. Pa smiled and put a hand on my head. I know he's sorry for being snappish. Only Grandpa seems grumpy this morning. 
I think his arm aches when it's wet. May 31st. Buster, Buster disappeared, so I walked back looking for him. I walked and looked and walked and walked. Suddenly, it was too quiet. I looked around. I couldn't hear the wagons. I couldn't see the dust. I stood still, my heart thumping. Was I lost? And then, there was Buster. He was sitting on a small rise, making pitiful little sounds, and oh, his pores were split and bloody. I snatched him up and hugged him, and he licked my face. I climbed the little rise, stood on tiptoe, looking around, nothing, no dust, but grasses as tall as my head, and silence. I was lost, lost. I looked at the sky, the sun was low, what should I do? I was already so thirsty, but which way to go? My heart was thundering. West, we'd been heading west. I took a deep breath. I held Buster close and headed into the setting setting sun and prayed. I walked for a long, long time. The sun set and it turned black. It was so black I couldn't see my own feet and I kept stumbling. How long had I been gone? Did anyone even know I was missing? I don't think I've ever been so scared. Buster got heavy, but I couldn't put him down because he might run off into the dark. Please, God, please, I prayed. Let me find them. Let them find me. But what if they never found me? You could die of thirst in just one day. I knew that. And the buzzards would come and wolves. No, don't think that, I told myself. Don't think. And then, just as the stars winked overhead, I heard it. Hoofbeats. Here, I yelled. I'm here. The hoofbeats came closer. But what if it was Indians? I didn't care. I'm here, I yelled again. And Grandpa came thundering up on Daisy. June 2nd. Today I walked alongside my friends again. I promised Ma I wouldn't leave them, not even for a second. We crossed a wide, sandy place. Ahead of us, we could see mountains looming. The sun blew something fierce. Not the sun, excuse me. The wind blew something fierce, and I used axle grease to soothe my lips. But they're so dry they bleed. I covered my head with my shirt, but then the sun beat down on my shoulders. It seems there's no way out of the sun and the heat, except when it rains. And then there's no way out of the rain. Adam was quiet today, so I asked what he was thinking. He said he was praying. I wondered if he prayed for me the day that I was lost. I wish I was good like him. All I do is complain. Ash Hollow. All of our spirits are raised. The scout rode ahead and found this fine spot. A breeze blows and there's a fresh stream. The mountains are all about and above us is Chimney Rock. It's split at the top as though by a lightning bolt. I took Becky to show her. She tilted her little back, head back and looked up smiling. I realized something then. At home, Becky used to cough and cough, especially at night. Now she rarely coughs even with all the dust. Around us, stars were winking and the mountain was turning purple. I whispered to God a little thank you prayer. Suddenly, I saw something. It wasn't just me and Becky there. Bobby was there too. She smiled at me. I sort of smiled back. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't think what. I wish now I had said something clever. Fort Laramie, June 10th. The fort is not at all like Fort Kearney. This one has tall walls and a big courtyard and Indians everywhere. Some were even sleeping on top of the walls. Our men and women were poking around inside the fort. We children were told to stay outside, but Charlie and Bobby and I sneaked in. We found rooms like bedrooms. There were buffalo skins spread on the floors for bed. There were decorations on the wall. And in one room, there was a scalp hanging from the wall. Sometimes some Indians kill people and keep their scalps as trophies. The scalp had hair on it about three feet long. Charlie dared Bobby and me to touch it. I touched the hair. Bobby touched the scalp part. We all acted like we weren't afraid, but I think we were. I keep thinking about whose head it was. June 11th. 
The temperature on our thermometer today said 110 degrees. June 12th, Rachel and Becky climb in my lap for stories at night. Becky keeps talking about buffalo. She says it like this, buffo. She even calls Lori, our cow with the tris- twisted horn, a buffo. Tonight, Rachel gave me a wildflower. Very seriously, she, seriously, she said, I like you. June 13th. Folks are suddenly very ill. Ma scurries from a wagon to wagon with medicines, but two of our party died today, and we passed six graves for an earlier wagon train. Folks get sick in the morning and are dead by sundown. We can't stop to nurse them. We barely stop long enough to bury them. Ma's afraid it's an outbreak of cholera. June 14th. So many more folks are ill. Farther back in our train, there's a family of six. Both Ma and the Pa died today. That leaves four orphans. Folks offer to take one or two children, but the eldest girl is 12. She won't part with any of the little ones. She says she'll be the mother now. Imagine. June 15th. Two babies died last night. One was the tiny Gibbons baby, March, baby March. The other one was the new Hull baby, little Kearney. Pa and Grandpa dug their grave this morning. We buried both babies together. At first, Mrs. Gibbons wouldn't give up her baby. Pa had to take it from her arms. I saw Pa wipe his face in his handkerchief. I wonder if he was crying. June 17th. The bugle woke us before sun before the sun was up. It was Cousin Daniel shouting orders. The river's rising and we must cross it. We scrambled things together. Becky sat in the wagon with Ma. Aunt Lizzie and Rachel sat in their laps. Pa took the reins of the oxen on one side. I was on the other side. Men on horseback swam into the river to guide the wagons. My heart was thundering. Remember what Joshua thinks about the water. He's afraid of the water. Within minutes, the oxen were swimming, but they began swimming downstream. Pa yelled. Cousin Daniel yelled. Men began shooting off their rifles. I saw Bobby pick up a rifle and begin shooting. I didn't know what to do. Suddenly, Grandpa was in the water beside me on his horse. He yelled at me to guide Daisy. Then, with just his one arm, he grabbed the reins of the oxen. In just a minute or two, the oxen turned and swam across. I felt ashamed. Was it my fault the oxen swam down the river? Wasn't I strong enough? Did they feel how scared I was? Later, Pa says it wasn't my fault. Oxen have a mind of their own, he said. At least our wagon stayed upright. Two others turned overturned. One of the overturned wagons belonged to the Douglas sisters. All their things got dumped out. A gown got all swollen up in the water and floated away. Bobby stood beside me. Look, she whispered, pointing with her rival. It looks like a dead lady. The floating lady was followed by barrels of flour and everything. Miss Emmeline's face got as white as snow. Grandpa told her not to fret. We'll all help out. We will. But now they have nothing. So we're going to stop there. There was a lot of things that happened in those readings. Maybe what Cousin Daniel was saying, that bad things are starting to happen. Maybe we'll meet some more characters. And we're learning about the characters that we've already met. Hope you're enjoying the book and I will meet you back here for part five.